Well, hello, everybody. Well, that looks kind of out of focus, doesn't it? Give it a little tap there. Um, well, let's see what this other camera looks like. Well, that looks somewhat better, doesn't it? I don't know what's up with that one camera, but we'll go with this one this evening. So how is everybody? Um, of course, welcome to the Gospel Minute from St. Michael's Orthodox Church, and I'm Steve Toby. And our saint of the day is Onesimus. And if you were here for morning prayers, you heard the Gospel um, from St. Paul, or the Gospel, you heard the Epistle from St. Paul to Philemon, who was the master, a slaveholder of Onesimus. So, Onesimus was the apostle who was from Colossae, was a bondservant of that Philemon, to whom the apostle addressed his epistle, which we read this morning. Onesimus escaped from Philemon and fled to Rome, where he became a disciple of St. Paul. St. Paul brought him to the faith of Christ and then sent him back to his master, who in turn gave him his freedom and sent him back to Rome again, where he ministered to St. Paul. Later he was seized because he was a Christian and was sent to Puteoli, where he was beaten to death with clubs. St. Onesimus is also commemorated on November 22nd with the holy apostles Philemon, Apphia, and Archippus. And the apolitikion for Onesimus is... O Holy Apostle Onesimus, intercede to our merciful God that he may grant our souls forgiveness of sins. And our contachion, thou didst shine upon the world as a bright sunbeam, shining with the rays of Paul, the son of the most resplendent light, who hath enlightened the world entire. Thus we all honor thee, blessed Onesimus. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, let's see if our other camera is behaving. There we go. That's better. Okay, so uh, tonight, um, after our psalm, our Bible study is, uh, we're going to look at the letter of, of St. Paul, his first letter to the church in Corinth, 1 Corinthians. And uh, tonight we'll do a little introduction about how the church was founded, when it was founded, and when, when and why this letter was written. And uh, so, but let's read our psalm for the evening. And it's Psalm number 58 in the Common Bible, or it's uh, Psalm 57 in the Septuagint. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Do you indeed decree what is right, you gods? Do you judge the children of man upright? No. In your hearts you devise wrongs. Your hands deal out violence on earth. The wicked are estranged from the womb. They go astray from birth, speaking lies. They have venom, venom like the venom of a serpent, like the deaf adder that stops its ear, so that it does not hear the voice of charmers or of the cunning enchanter. O God, break their teeth in their mouths. Tear out the fangs of the young lions, O Lord. Let them vanish like water that runs away. When he aims his arrows, let them be blunted. Let them be all like the snail that dissolves into slime, like the stillborn child who never sees the sun. Sooner than your pots can feel the heat of thorns, whether green or ablaze, may he sweep them away. The righteous will rejoice when he sees the vengeance. He will bathe his feet in the blood of the wicked. Mankind will say, Surely, there is a reward for the righteous. Surely there is a God who judges on the earth. The Word of God. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And let me raise my table up here a little bit. There we go. Okay. So, 1 Corinthians is our Bible study. But before we do that, let's go around and say hello to everybody. Catherine, good to see you. John Costas, Colleen, uh, Bernie, Bernie Grand's here. Augustine, Violetta, good evening, Violetta. Jonathan Nichols, good to see you, Jonathan. Mano Marx, good evening to you. And over here, Ruth, 
Ruth, good evening. And uh, Carol Baca, that is Mother Elizabeth, is with us this evening. And since she's here and I'm reminded, make sure to check out the uh, New Teak Vinskeet. That's down in Florida. They have a website. It's a New Teak Vin. And um, let me see. Carol. Um, would you, uh, Mother Elizabeth, would you do me a favor and, uh, write on there, uh, in the comments section, your, uh, uh, skeet, the name of your skeet, how to spell it and everything, contact for people. Do that for me, would you? And we'll share that. Phil Collins is here. Good evening to you, Jacqueline Pierres. Comment ça va? <coughs> Tout va bien ici. And let me see here. Lena May, Anna Gennaro, Marianne Russell, Karen Krilanovich. Karen Krilanovich, good to see you, Karen. We've been praying for you. We've been praying for your mother and your children and grandchildren. Marianne Russell, Nellie Cartvelli. Nellie, good to see you. Deborah Goodall is here. And Lena May says, I love hearing about St. Paul's journeys. I never knew that he had vision problems until learning it from you. He must have struggled even more than we will ever know with spreading the teachings of Christ. And he did suffer. He did suffer quite a bit. And uh, by the way, uh, he went to Corinth and established the church there in the year, around the year 50, probably 50 or 51. And um, that was his second missionary journey. So. And Zuleika, how are you? Anna Gennaro, Joanne Manaski, all the regulars. Jay Russell, good evening. Rista Doulas, good evening. Joseph Khalil. And Karen, we will pray for you this evening. And do it. Okay, just check here one more time. Rufus Ambrose, good evening, Rufus. Good to see you. Okay, so 1 Corinthians. Now, this was probably written between the years 53 and 55, and it was written from uh, Ephesus, which, where uh, Paul had gone after he left Corinth. Um, and as I said, uh, just a few, a few seconds ago, that Paul founded this church, and he founded it in the year 50. Now, we learned last night in Romans chapter 15, I think it was, or the night before, uh, yes. Thus I make it my ambition to preach the gospel, not where Christ has already been named, lest I build on someone else's foundation, but as it is written. So we can assume that he was the first one to bring the gospel of Jesus Christ to the Corinthians. Now, Corinth is, uh, let me see if I can bring that up here. Um, that's not it, but this might be it. There we go. So on his second missionary trip, and I hope you can see my little hand there. Okay, he went to Athens, where he spoke in the Areopagus, uh, I guess. And... Um, he made some converts in, in Athens. And then from Athens, he went over here to Corinth. Now, Corinth is a, was a major, major uh, seaport. In fact, it was a double seaport. And what would happen is ships coming from Turkey and all throughout here would come to Corinth and they would offload their cargo on one side of the city, and it's on a little isthmus, and then they would bring it across to the other side, to the other port, it was a double port, two ports in Corinth, put it back on board ship, and then bring it up into the north, into the west, and ultimately probably to Rome, which is not too far away. So, the population in Corinth was not like the population in Athens. In Athens, people were sophisticated. And uh, in Ephesus, 
the people were very, very uh, sophisticated and very well educated. But in Corinth, that probably was not the case. Now, I don't remember her name, but the uh, goddess of carnal love had a great temple there. And um, the main occupations were uh, dock workers um, and prostitutes. Dock workers and prostitutes. So, you know, it wasn't a very uh, sophisticated uh, audience that he was speaking to. So, he will use very different language and a very, very different style um, in this letter and in his second letter to the Corinthians than he would, for, say, for the church in Ephesus, where they were very, very sophisticated. So, now... <coughs> Let's backtrack here a little bit. Let's go to Acts chapter 18. So, Acts uh, chapter 18, it starts uh, really with Paul has left, has left Athens, and he's going to arrive at Corinth right here. And I hope you can see that hand, that little finger there. There we go. Okay, so after this, that is after Paul left uh, Athens and went to Corinth, and he found a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to leave Rome. Now, in Romans chapter, Romans chapter 16, last night we read that Paul sent his greetings to Priscilla and Aquila. They had moved, they had been expelled from Rome Probably, oh, in the uh, 40s, maybe, and uh, by Claudius. And then after Claudius passed away, they went back to Rome, and that's where they received, um, that's where Paul sent his letter in the year 57 or so. so. And he says, make sure you say hello to Aquila and Priscilla. Well, he met them in Corinth. So... And he found a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had commanded all Jews to leave Rome. And he went to see them. And because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them and worked, for they were tent makers by trade, as was St. Paul. Now, every Jewish, every Jewish boy is going to learn a trade, something that he can fall back on. Well, for Paul, even as well-educated as he was. Remember, Paul had a first-rate education, not only in scriptural studies under Gamaliel, who was the foremost, foremost rabbi of his day, but also in classical literature. And if we go back to chapter uh, 17, where he's addressing the Romans, and he's, uh, he's quoting uh, Greek poets from the 6th century before Christ, he's very, very literate, not only scripturally, but he had a great classical education also. So, um, he, he had taken up a secondary trade, something to fall back on, as tent making. And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and tried to persuade the Jews and the Greeks. He would, as was his normal mode, he would go to the synagogue, the local synagogue, and preach and teach there. Okay? And which he did in Corinth. Now when Silas and Timothy arrived from Macedonia, Paul was occupied with the word, testifying to the Jews that the Christ was Jesus. And when they opposed and reviled him, he shook out his garments and said to them, Your blood be on your own heads. I am innocent. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. And he left there and went to the house of a man named Titius Justus, a worshiper of God. Now his house was next door to the synagogue. So Paul had been thrown out of the synagogue. So he goes next door. And I can see it on the Sabbath. Now, he's standing by an open window and the Jews are in the synagogue next door, and he's at, the, at an open window proclaiming, proclaiming as loud as he can Jesus Christ and the gospel of Jesus. I can, I can just see this. So, 
Um, and he left uh, there, that is the, uh, the uh, synagogue, and went to the house of a man named Titius Justus, a worshiper of God. His house was next door to the synagogue. Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, believed in the Lord together with his entire household. And many of the Corinthians, hearing Paul, believed and were baptized. And the Lord said to Paul one night in a vision, now this is relatively important, do not be afraid, but go on speaking and do not be silent. For I am with you and no one will attack you to harm you. For I have many in this city who are my people. And he stayed a year and six months teaching the word of God among them. Now the Lord said that to him. And I have a red letter edition of the Bible here. So the Lord's words are in red, and this is in red, and I do not disagree with this. The Lord said, do not be afraid. Go on speaking, do not be silent. Evidently, remember, the Jews in the synagogue had opposed and reviled him. They hated him. And this was a roughneck crowd. Dock workers, prostitutes everywhere. This was a rough, rough crowd. And Paul probably felt uh, fear for his life. Um, that the Lord had to come to him and say, don't be afraid, go on speaking, I'll be with you. Do not be silent. And no one will attack, will attack you or harm you, for I have many people in this city. So Paul stayed and he taught in Corinth for a year and a half, 18 months. Okay? teaching the word of God. And he established the church there in Corinth. But when Gallio was proconsul of Achaia, that's the Roman proconsul, the Roman governor, and Achaia is on our map uh, right up here to the north and east of uh, Corinth. Right there, if you can see it. I hope you can see it fine. So, he was the Roman um, governor of Achaia. The Jews made a united attack on Paul and brought him before the tribunal, saying, this man is persuading people to worship God contrary to the law. But when Paul was about to open his mouth, Galileo said to the Jews, if it were a matter of wrongdoing or vicious crime, O Jews, I would have reason to accept your complaint. But since it is a matter of questions about words and names and your own law, see to it yourselves. I refuse to be a judge of these things. And he drove them all from the tribunal. And they all seized Sostatinius, the ruler of the synagogue, and beat him in front of the tribunal. But Galileo paid no attention to any of his friends. So what happened was the Jews got together and they brought Paul before the uh, governor to judge this, um, to judge Paul, because he'd been making trouble. But the Roman governor says, look, I don't want to hear this. You know, if he was guilty of a civil crime or accused of a civil crime, I would hear it. But you're talking about your own religious laws, which I want nothing to do with, nothing. So he threw him out of court. Well, the Jews were so angry at Sostatines that uh, for bringing Paul to court and for embarrassing them all, that they beat him in front of the courthouse. But Galileo paid no attention. Galileo, of course, was the proconsul. He paid no attention. He sort of washed his hands of the whole affair. So, I think we're done with our map. So after this, Paul stayed many days longer and then took leave of the brothers and set sail for Syria. With him came Priscilla and Aquila. At Sincrea, he had cut his hair for he was under a vow. What kind of vow would he be under? Well, he was probably under the vow of a Nazarite. Who was a Nazarite? Well, a Nazarite took a vow to dedicate themselves to God entirely. And um, they wouldn't cut their hair. They wouldn't take any strong drink. Um, and they would live a very ascetic life. 
St. John the Baptist is a wonderful example of one who probably took the um, Nazarite, Nazarite uh, vow. I think the first one to take a Nazarite vow was, in the Bible was Samson. Remember Samson and Delilah, that story? Well, Samson had taken a uh, Nazarite vow, and that was the source of his great strength. And he lost all that strength when Delilah cut his hair. So, in Sincrea, Paul cuts his hair. That, that sort of says, well, that's the end of, you know, my time in the, uh, uh, of the vow. Uh, normally, the Nazarite vow would only last for two, three weeks, maybe a month. Some people, like St. John the Baptist, probably their whole lives. But cutting the hair ended his vow. And uh, so they left, uh, they left uh, Corinth, went down the coast a little bit to Sincrea, um, and from Sincrea he sails to Ephesus. So he's established the church in Corinth. Um, they bring him in front of a trial. He meets Priscilla and Aquila, and... Now I think we can safely go to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. We have an idea of where Corinth is, um, both physically from our map, and we have an idea of when all these things happened. Paul established the church there around the year 50 and wrote this letter after he left Corinth and was in Ephesus oh, between 53 and 55. So, Chapter 1 of 1 Corinthians. Paul, called by the will of God to be an apostle of Christ Jesus and our brother Sosthenes. Who was Sosthenes? I think we just read about him. Um, yes, we did. Sosthenes, remember, was the uh, ruler of the temple who had brought the case against Paul to the Roman uh, proconsul, the Roman governor who threw the case out of court, and the people uh, the, of the synagogue beat him on the courthouse steps for embarrassing them and bringing up this case against Paul. Now he's joined up with Paul. In fact, he's co-writing this letter to Paul. So, Paul called by the will of God to be an apostle of Christ Jesus and our brother Sosthenes to the church of God that is in Corinth, to those sanctified, that is meant, that is uh, made holy in Christ Jesus, called to be saints together with all those who in every place call upon the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, both their Lord and ours. Grace to you and peace from God, our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Sort of a um, standard opening, maybe a little brief, but it's kind of a standard opening for Paul, although it may be a bit brief. So, he goes on, I give thanks to my God always for you because of the grace of God that was given you in Christ Jesus, that in every way you were enriched in him in all speech and all knowledge, even as the testimony about Christ was confirmed among you, so that you are not lacking in any gift as you await for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ. They had been taught. They had been taught the word of Christ, God. They had, and the testimony about Christ had been confirmed among them. Okay? They had been enriched in all speech and all knowledge about Christ. They have no excuse for what's about to come. So let's listen. So he says, you are not lacking in any gift as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will sustain you to the end, guiltless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful by whom you are called, called into the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Now he lowers a hammer. I appeal to you, brothers, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be united in the same mind and the same judgment. 
Okay, that's good. For it has been reported to me by Chloe's people that there is quarreling among you, my brothers. Now, who's Chloe? Well, Chloe was uh, an important, obviously a very important person in the church in Corinth. And uh, she had sent a delegation off to Ephesus uh, and uh, reported to Paul that we have some problems. We have some problems in Corinth with the church that you established there. Okay, well, what were those problems? Well, for it's been reported to me by Chloe's people that there is quarreling among you, my brothers. What I mean is that each one of you says, I follow Paul, or I follow Apollos, or I follow Cephas, or I follow Christ. Now, I got a little itch here. Cephas is Peter. After Paul had established the church, he had gone where uh, no apostle, no preacher, minister had gone before him. After he left and established the church, evidently Peter had come and preached there. And this fellow, Apollos. Well, who's Apollos? Well, we've got to go back to the book of Acts again. Still in chapter 18, verse 24. We'll start there. Now a Jew named Apollos, a native of Alexandria, came to Ephesus. He was an eloquent man, competent in the scriptures. The scriptures, of course, was the Old Testament. He had been instructed in the way of the Lord, and being fervent in spirit, he spoke and taught accurately the things concerning Jesus, though he knew only the baptism of John. He began to speak boldly in the synagogue, but when Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. And when he wished to cross to Achaia, remember that Achaia was in the uh, north and west of Corinth, and when, he, uh, and when he wished to cross to Achaia, the brothers encouraged him and wrote to the disciples to welcome him. When he arrived, he greatly helped those who through grace had believed, for he powerfully refuted the Jews in public, showing by the scriptures that Christ, the Christ was Jesus. So, he had, this Apollos, he had been preaching the word of God, repentance, and about our Lord, but he only knew about the baptism of John. It's up to, he didn't have the full story. So Aquila and Priscilla took him aside and look, the Christ has arrived. The Messiah has arrived. It was this Jesus of Nazareth? Apollos probably his eyes opened really wide, and they said, yes, the, and the Jews uh, took him, and crucified him, but he was resurrected from the dead. And he ascended into heaven after 40 days. And now he has established, we have established our church, the Christian way. They called it the way back then. And Apollos must have said, no kidding. Wow. So Aquila and Priscilla fully instructed him, and he went on back to Corinth and Achaia and taught in those places. So the people are saying, each one of you says, I follow Paul, or I follow Apollos, or I follow Cephas, that's Peter, or I follow Christ. Is Christ divided, Paul says? Was Paul crucified for you? Was I crucified for you? No. Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? No, I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius so that no one may say that you were baptized in my name. Oh, then he says in parenthesis, I did baptize also the house of Stephanus. Beyond that, I do not know whether I baptized anyone else. For Christ did not send me to baptize. That wasn't my job, but to preach the gospel and not with words of eloquent wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. He wasn't going to be eloquent in speech like he had just been in Athens or as he was in uh, Ephesus. People who would 
who were sophisticated, who were educated. He wasn't going to be eloquent to the Corinthians who were very much less educated and very much less sophisticated. Dock workers and prostitutes. Shopkeepers. No. He was going to speak plainly to them. And he speaks very, very plainly throughout this letter to the Corinthians. So, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. You wouldn't understand if I was eloquent, if I spoke in long sentences and eloquent, flowery speech. You wouldn't understand it. So, for the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the, of the discerning I will thwart. Okay. Those who are, think they're wise, okay, they're, they have their pride. And they say, beyond, this is beneath me, or, you know the type. So, and where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? Think about it. If you are coming into a strange land who had never heard of Jesus Christ, and um, they had a, a great God, a Zeus, they had a whole panoply of gods, Zeus and Mercury and Diana and all these gods, and they built beautiful temples to them. And you say, well, you know, the, there's one true God, and he sent his son to earth. So far, they're listening. Okay. And, uh, well, you know, they crucified him. They crucified the God. Yeah, they, they crucified him. They beat him and they crucified him. And they buried him. And, uh, well, he was resurrected from the dead. He was what? He was resurrected from the dead. You're telling me that he was resurrected from the dead? Well, that doesn't happen. Anyone with any intelligence will tell you, once you're dead, once you're buried, and you're in the grave for three days, you ain't coming out. You're dead. And no God gets crucified. So, has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? All those who think, how can this be? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom. We don't know God through wisdom, through how smart we are. No, we know God through faith, through faith, okay? It pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe, to those who have faith. For Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, which is a stumbling block to the Jews and a folly to the Jew to the Gentiles. Crucified? Crucified? They they crucify criminals. They don't crucify gods. They don't crucify messiahs. They crucify criminals. And that's what the Jews and that's what the Gentiles thought. So it was a his crucifixion was a stumbling block to them. But to, those to, but to those who are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Boy, that's the truth. They were not well educated. They were not sophisticated, as I have said over and over again. Not many were powerful, but many were of, not many were of noble birth. They were the lowly. They were the dock workers. They were the prostitutes. They were the shopkeepers, lower um, echelons of society, lower rung of society. But God shows what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God shows what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God shows what is low and despised in the world, which all of you were. 
God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, that no human being might boast in the presence of God. And because of him, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption, so that, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. Amen. End of chapter 1 of 1 Corinthians. Tomorrow, chapter 2, as we go on and on. All righty. Obviously, no book this evening. We're fast running out of time, and we're going to run real late because I got carried away. So, without further ado, let us start our prayer, which is probably the most important thing, which is the most important thing that we do here. So, let me see here, just so we get this evening prayers, and our, there's our icon corner. Now, I'm going to check back with everybody to see if you have any um, prayer requests before we finish our prayers this evening. So, write them in the uh, comments section if you have any prayers. And I'll read your comments and prayer requests uh, a little later, but we'll get to them, don't worry. That's an important part of all of this. So, if you have your icon corner, get in front of it. If you don't have an icon corner, make one. And if you're not near your icon corner, well, you can use our icon corner right here on your screen. So, no excuse. Let's all pray together, my friends. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Glory to thee, our God. Glory to thee. O heavenly King, O Comforter, the Spirit of Truth, who art in all places and fillest all things, treasury of good things and giver of life, come and dwell in us and cleanse us from every stain and save our souls, O gracious Lord. Holy God, holy, mighty, holy, immortal, have mercy on us. Holy God, holy, mighty, holy, immortal, have mercy on us. Holy God, holy, mighty, holy, immortal, have mercy on us. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, now and ever, not to the ages of ages. Amen. All Holy Trinity, have mercy on us. Lord, cleanse us from our sins. Master, pardon our iniquities. Holy God, visit and heal our infirmities for thy name's sake. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. Now and ever, not to the ages of ages. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Through the prayers of our Holy Fathers, Lord Jesus Christ our God, have mercy on us and save us. Amen. Now that the day has come to a close, I thank thee, O Lord, and I ask that the evening with the night may be sinless. Grant this to me, O Savior, and save me. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. Now that the day is past, I glorify thee, O Master, and I ask that the evening with the night may be without offense. Grant this to me, O Savior, and save me, both now and ever, and unto the ages of ages. Amen. Now that the day has run its course, I praise thee, O Holy One, and I ask that the evening with the night may be undisturbed. Grant this to me, O Savior, and save me. Lord, have mercy. 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 Lord have mercy, Lord have mercy, Lord have mercy. Lord have mercy, Lord have mercy, Lord have mercy. O Lord our God, if during this day I have sinned, whether in word or deed or thought, forgive me all, for thou art good and lovest mankind. Grant me peaceful and undisturbed sleep, and deliver me from all influence and temptation of the evil one. Raise me up again in proper time, that I may glorify thee, for thou art blessed with thine only begotten Son and thine all Holy Spirit, now and ever, and unto the ages of ages. Amen. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the only begotten, begotten of the Father before all worlds, light of light, true God of true God, begotten not made of one essence with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven, and was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and was made man, and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate, 
and suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again according to the Scriptures, and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he shall come again with glory to judge the living and the dead, whose kingdom shall have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins. I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. O Christ our God, who at all times and in every hour, in heaven and on earth, art worshipped and glorified, who art long-suffering, merciful and compassionate, who lovest the just and showest mercy upon the sinner, who callest all to salvation through the promise of blessings to come. O Lord, in this hour receive our supplications and direct our lives according to thy commandments. Sanctify our souls, hallow our bodies, correct our thoughts, cleanse our minds, deliver us from all tribulation, evil, and distress. Encompass us with thy holy angels, that guided and guarded by them we may attain to the unity of the faith and to the knowledge of thine unapproachable glory. For thou art blessed unto ages of ages. Amen. Okay. Now, let's pray for our own, our own intentions. And I will check back for any uh, comments or uh, other prayer intentions before we finish. Colleen asks that we pray for Sheila and Stephanie. Elena for her. Jonathan asks we pray for his health. And Dina Triantas for her granddaughter and granddaughter's family and for her health and the health of her family. Marianne Russell for Connie who passed away. Sharon my wife for John and Kay, Kurt Lytle for Father Benedict, and the monks of the Holy Cross Monastery in Wayne, West Virginia. Kurt also asks we pray for Chris and his daughter, for Rachel and Nicole, also his daughters, for, Chris, uh, for Terry, who has pneumonia, and for Gail, who has leukemia. Anna Gennaro for Rose, uh, who's last I heard is back in the ICU. And uh, she also asks us to pray for John, who has cancer. Meredith asks us to pray for Katie, Jake, and Addie. Valerie asks we pray for her health. Donna for Anthony. Um, Anthony has a speech problem. We pray that clears up. May you and Chuck for her aunt, who's 93, just a few days ago. John Costas. Um, John is returning to work after 11 weeks, I think, being uh, on leave. And uh, he's going to return to work on the 18th of this month. And he asks that uh, he may be blessed and become a beacon for Christ while he's at work. Chip Phillips asks we pray for Clara, who's in a moment of crisis, time of crisis. Joseph Khalil for Toby and Luke, Annabelle and Gabriella, Odette, for, uh, that's his mother, for her health, for Renia, and for his whole family. Risa Gonzalez for Nico Antonio, Harula, her mother, and Arturo, her husband. Danella Salico for Zoe, her daughter, and for her special intention. Barbara Rome for her husband and son that they come to the Orthodox faith. Stuart Jones for his family and for him. And Cheryl for Wilma Hamilton and Susan, her sister, for her health. Brandy for Carla. Adriana for the health of her family and for her. Alina May for her husband, for her health. We pray for her health and for her special intention. And Anna Gennaro for June, who just recently passed away. Deborah is dealing with a friend, with an, a loved one, who has an addiction, and we pray for both of them. David Sauls asks us to pray for the Aid and Nassad families, for the ministry of Father Antipas of Nairobi, the health of Maria Shalakova, and for Shaza and Zephrin, who are in Syria. Both their husbands have left them, and Shaza has cancer. We pray for them. Katerina Pappas for Thomas, her husband. Maria Kukadakis for her grandson. Luana for Miss Terry Robbins and her special intention. Deborah for Kristen. And Paul Collins for the health of his children. Catherine asks that we pray for John, David, Brandon, Lexi, Nicole, and Nicholas. Rebecca, Tiffany, Catherine, Gary, and Taylor. And uh, Lexi had a friend, Deidre. She passed away last week. 
We pray for her. And Catherine also asked for prayers for Michelle Mann, who has breast cancer. I ask we pray for Sarah, my granddaughter, and Sean, my son, and uh, for Sharon, my wife, for her health. Augustine asks we pray for his father and children. Rufus for Norma, Vivian, Wilma, and Hazel. Bernie Grand for his health and the health and for his family. They come to Christ. Elder Millennial asks that we pray for his family, for his aunt, for his niece, and his uncle who just recently passed away. And we pray for Elder Millennial that he's successful in his studies as he goes back to school. Katerina asks we pray for Vanessa, Jasmine, and Daphne. Karen Kalanovich, not feeling well. We pray for her that she feels better soon. We pray for her health. And Karen also asks we pray for Marjorie, her uh, mother. And Karen asks we pray for her children and grandchildren. Millie asks we pray for Andrew, her son, that he comes to Jesus. Stacy asks we pray for Michelle, David, Uncle Malcolm, and Michael. Zet for health. Anna for Joseph, her brother. And for Daniel. Uh, her son-in-law, that he comes to Christ and he brings his family with him. We pray for the health of Joanne Manaski and for her daughter Aaron and Aaron's husband for their health. Ron Best for his intentions, Valerie for her son and grandson. Stephanie Acario asks for our prayers. Paul Collins asks we pray for his aunt, and he has a special intention. Saspienza for Natalie, who has cancer, and Saspienza's daughter. There, uh, Catherine Salcedo, for all of those who have addictions, and for her husband, and for the newly departed Anna. Elizabeth Mercier asks that uh, she finds comfort, relief from pain, and peace in the Lord. And Elizabeth asks us to pray for a friend of hers who is also in pain. Harold Bradford for his nephew. Zarina Kelly for her son and future daughter-in-law and uh, mother-in-law, that they have an increase in faith. And Zarina asks we pray for her five grandchildren. Spiro and Helen, um, for their children, Chris, Roxanne, and Maddox, Brandy, uh, for her studies in the field of nursing, Gail, for her son, Scott, Rob King, for his children and grandchildren, Jay Russell, for Jackson, Michael and Kelly Hatton, for their health and for the health of their daughter, who had heart surgery, Art James, for the health of his brother, George, and Lori, for her cousin, David who has cancer, and for Jessica, who is suffering from kidney failure, Travula for the health of Marie, Melania for Ingrid, Z asks that we pray for Jenny and Frank, Martine and David, and Pat and Z, Connie for her children and grandchildren, that they come back to the Orthodox faith, and Connie asks that we pray for the health of David and Evangelina, Valerie asks us that we pray for Alexis, Nellie Cartvelli for Cotney, um, Dalio for his intention, Luana for Aunt Benita's health, Uncle Keith and the health of James Grass, and Luana would like to find full-time work, and we pray for that. Norma, as we pray for her sister, Stacy Bellis, for the health of her brother-in-law, Colleen for the health of Clay, and for her new granddaughter, Claire Marie, and Colleen has a special intention, and we pray for that. Uh, Phil and Brandy have a special intention. Well, that special intention is they want to adopt a baby from the Philippines, and we pray that that happens. Vicky, as we pray for Sarah and Alexandra, their daughter and granddaughter, that they are protected from domestic abuse. Alione asks us that we pray for her husband and children. Susan, for Michael, Mar Marina, David, Matthew, Elisa, James, Jody, Emily, and Samantha, um, that they return to Christ and their orthodox faith, and that David receives the gifts of faith. He does not believe in God. Susan asks that we pray that Sammy gets baptized. And Deborah asks us to pray for Tatiana Alexis, her brand new granddaughter, and that's her 11th grandchild. John Costas asks us to pray for Nick, Aubrey, Barbara, Catherine and family, Kathy Lee, Gary and Tiffany, Leticia, Marianne, Gina, and Ralph Blakesley, who has a very bad heart. We pray for him. Randy and Philip for Tracy and George. Valerie for Alexis, Marina, and Chris. Marianne Russell for Kathy and the newborn Violet, who's doing well. Thank you. And uh, Marianne Russell asks us to pray for Louise, who has heart failure. Colleen for Marie and her husband for their health. David Saul for Fatima Muhammad, 
Uh, Melanie Curiasu asked for our prayers, and Phil Collins asked that we pray for the health of Dee. Annie and Chris asked we pray for their family and son. Kristen Powers for her family, Z Francis, for Amanda, Lexis, and Ray for their health, Jacqueline Pierre for her daughter and family, and for Tanya, Ramona Antonesi for George, who has cancer, Valerie Goulet for Christopher, and Jay Russell asks us to pray for Jim Jackson and Carl Johnson, both suffering from uh, cancer. <clears throat> Rufus. Rufus asks us to pray for Inez Stevenson's health, Marianne Russell for Barbara, Greg, and Jeffrey, and for Anne Hubiak. Kathy Zances for Sophia, uh, Philip for Paul, Sherry for Jaron, that he finds work. Uh, Debbie Owens, uh, that she finds a less stressful job and uh, perhaps a job with better pay. And I ask that we all pray for the Owens family, a family that I love very, very much. And uh, we pray for their health and uh, happiness and peace in that family. Carol Lord asks us to pray for her Karen, who has relapsed uh, breast cancer. Serge, one of our members, um, is in the armed forces and he's being deployed overseas. And we pray for his safety um, and the safety of all our service members. Catherine Salcedo asks us to pray for Bianca and Rodrigo, Jay Russell for Tom Gall, Anna Gennaro for Areti, her mother who passed away this past November, Alita Hagos for her children, Colleen for her husband's health, and Deborah Goodall for Kristen, who is suffering from thyroid cancer. Now, let's go around the room and see. Ah, thank you, uh, Mother Elizabeth. That's the new Tikvin Skeet of the Holy Mother of God. And Tikvin is spelled T-I-K-H-V-I-N. Thank you very much for that. It's a good site. Um, and uh, it's a wonderful ministry. They minister the gospel of Jesus Christ through music. Great, great, great work. Thank you. And Ruth, always glad to... And Kathy Zances wants to pray for her mother, Anastasia's health. And we, of course, will do that. Anastasia. And Lord, don't forget Anastasia, Kathy Zance's mother. And for Father Anthony, Archimendrite Father Anthony, he has breathing troubles and health issues. We pray for him. Thank you, Mother. Carol Baca. And uh, Brandy's here. Brandy says we're all here. And over here, well, we'll have a whole slew of people over here. So let's go, let's go down. Any last minute prayers? Good evening, Samer, DeWitt, Sharon. Sharon says, hello, this is Sharon. Max is doing what he does best, sleeping. Stravulas, how are you? Stravula, how are you? We prayed for Marina tonight. Boris, Robert Lurie, good evening. Josie Villanueva, good evening to you. Lily Milanovic, Ruth. John Klutchko. 
Halioni, good evening. Michael Coffey, there's a man who's inspired me along many years. Michael Coffey, great man. Geraldine, good evening. Zanella, good evening. Late, but I sure made it. Yes, you did. Jay Russell says, prayers for God's blessings and healing grace for you and your family. Thank you. Any prayers over here on YouTube? And Augustine asks that we pray for his sister Nectaria with health problems. Yes, we will. And Catherine says, please. Oh, Catherine, we'll pray for your sister, Patricia. Amy Green says, I'm late. I'm late too, but I'm here. And Catherine says, John the Baptist was a Nazarite. I believe that's true. Oh, someone asked last night what I thought was the, uh, the thorn in uh, Paul's side. Well, I believe that, that after thinking about it a little bit, I think the thorn in his side were the... Uh, Judaizers, those who came behind him. Of course, you remember he taught, we need faith, the law. We don't need the law as was practiced. We need faith in Christ, and, the, uh, and faith in Christ means trusting in God and, his, and Christ and his commandments. And the Judaizers would come right behind him and say, oh, you've got to follow all the laws of uh, of Moses and, and the first five books of the Bible, and you've got to get circumcised, and you've got to follow all the kosher laws and all of that. So they were coming behind him, and uh, that really came to a head for him in Galatia. When we, read, when we get to Galatians, we'll see that. Um, so I believe they were the thorn in his side. Okay. So, dear Lord, we pray that you extend your healing hands on these people that we have prayed for. So many are suffering spiritually, physically, and emotionally, and we all need your help. We need your grace. We need your love and your mercy. We ask for that. And we ask that the most, uh, the most holy Virgin Mary, the Theotokos, adds our prayers and intentions to hers, and that... St. Onesimus, our saint of the day, um, adds our prayers and intentions to hers. And of course, this wonderful prayer, O Holy Father, Heavenly Physician of our souls and bodies, who has sent your only begotten Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, to heal all our ailments and del deliver us from death, visit and heal your servants, granting them release from pain and restoration to health and vigor, that they may give thanks unto you and bless your holy name, of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, now and ever, and unto the ages of ages. Amen. Well, folks, I'll see you again tomorrow morning uh, for morning prayers as you're getting yourself ready to go to church. And um, then again tomorrow evening for the Gospel Minute Now, or Gospel Minute Live, and we'll continue on with Chapter 2 of uh, 1 Corinthians. Oh, may God bless us all in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Oh, give them